Okay, I'm going to read a session in The Unknown Reality, Volume 1, uh, by Jane Roberts, obviously a Seth book, so hold on. Okay, this is session 688, March 6th, 1974. I'm going to put on this. This is just Rob's notes. If you want to read it, you can pause it. Okay, I always only read the pertinent parts. I leave out the notes unless they are obviously pertinent. So, this is incredible information here. Okay. He begins to say, The CUs, or units of consciousness, are literally in every place and time at once. They possess the greatest adaptability and profound inborn propensity for organization of all kinds. They act as individuals, and yet each carries within it a knowledge of all other kinds of activity that is happening in any other given unit or group of units. Coming together, the units actually form the system of reality in which they have their experience. In your system, for example, they are within the phenomenal world. They will always come under the guise of any particular pattern of reality then. In your terms, they can move forward or backward in time, but they also possess another kind of interior mobility within time as you know it. As there are insides to apples, so think of the ordinary moment as an apple. In usual experience, you hold that ap apple in your hand or eat it. Using this analogy, the apple itself as the moment would contain infinite variations of itself within itself. These CUs, therefore, can operate even within time as you understand it in ways that are most difficult to explain. Time not only goes backward and forward, but inward and outward. I am still using your idea of time here to some degree. Later in this book, I hope to lead you beyond it entirely, but in the terms in which I am speaking, it is the inward and outward directions of time that give you a universe that seems to be fairly permanent and yet is also being created. This inward and outward thrust allows for several important conditions that are necessary for the establishment of relatively separate, stable universe systems. Such a system may seem like a closed one from any viewpoint within itself, yet this inward and outward thrusting condition effectively sets up the boundaries and uniqueness of each universal system while allowing for a certain give and take of energy among them. No energy is ever lost. It may seem to disappear from one system, but if so, it will emerge in another. The inward and outward thrust that is not perceived is largely responsible for what you think of as ordinary consecutive time. It is of the utmost and supreme importance, of course, that these CUs are literally indestructible. They can take any form, organize themselves in any kind of time behavior, and seem to form a reality that is completely dependent upon its apparent form and structure. Yet, disappearing through one of the physicist's black holes, for example, though structure and form would seem to be annihilated and time drastically altered, there would be an emergence at the other end, where the whole package of a universe having been closed in the black hole would be reopened. There is the constant surge into your universe of new energy through infinite minute sources. The sources are the CUs themselves, in their own way, and using an analogy now, 
In certain respects, at least, the CUs operate as minute but extremely potent black holes and white holes, as they are presently understood by your physicists. The CUs, following that analogy, serve as source points or holes through which energy falls into your system or is attracted to it, and in so doing, forms it. The experience of forward time and the appearance of physical matter in space and time and all the phenomenal world results. As CUs leave your system, time is broken down. Its effects are no longer experienced as consecutive and matter becomes more and more plastic until its mental elements become apparent. New CUs enter and leave your system constantly, then. Within the system in mass, however, through their great and small organizational structures, the CUs are aware of everything happening, not only on the top of the moment, but within it, in all of its probabilities. This means that, biologically, the cell is aware of all of its probable variations, while in your time and structures, it holds its unique position as a part, say, of any given organ in your body. In greater terms, the cell is a huge physical universe, orbiting an invisible CU, and in your terms, the CU will always be invisible beyond the smallest phenomenon that you can perceive with any kind of instrument. To some extent, however, its act can be indirectly apprehended through its effect upon the phenomenon that you can perceive. The EE units mentioned earlier, electromagnetic energy units mentioned earlier, represent the stage of emergence the threshold point that practically activates the CUs in your terms. We will have more to say about these later. It is vital that you understand this inward and outward thrust of time and realize that from this flows the consecutive appearance of the moment. The thrusting gives dimensions to time that so far you have not even begun to realize. Again, you live on the surface of the moments, with no understanding of the unrecognized and unofficial realities that lie beneath. All of this, once more, is tied in with your accepted neurological recognition of certain messages over others, your mental prejudice that effectively blinds you to other quite valid biological communications that are indeed present all of the time. I am trying to tell you something about the greater reality of your species, yet to do so with any justice. Justice, I must divest you, if possible, of certain concepts about the beginning of time or man's early history. To start with, however, we will for a while lean on the old terminology while hoping to gradually leave it behind. The CUs form all systems simultaneously, having formed yours and from their energy diversifying themselves into physical forms, they were aware of all of the probable variations from any given biological strain. There was never any straight line of development as, say, from reptiles to mammals, ape and man. Instead, there were great, still-continuing, infinitely rich, parallel explosions of life forms and patterns in as many directions as possible. There were animal men and man-animals, using your terms, that shared both time and space for many centuries. This is, as you all well know, a physical system in time. Here, cells die and are replaced. Knowing their own indestructibility, the CUs within them simply changed form, retaining, however, the identity of all the cells that they have been. 
while the cell dies physically, its inviolate nature is not betrayed. It is simply no longer physical. That kind of death is then natural in one way or another within your system. I am speaking here from many viewpoints, and later I will discuss in full your ideas of mortality. Here, however, let me state that all life is cooperative. It also, it, it also knows it exists beyond its form. The experience of your species involves a certain kind of consciousness development highly vital. This necessitated a certain kind of specialization, a certain long-term identification with form. Cellular structure maintains brilliant effectiveness in the body's present reality, but knows itself free of it. Man's particular kind of consciousness fiercely identified with the body. This was a necessity to focus energy toward physical manipulation. To some important extent, the same applies to the animals. The cells might gladly die, but the specifically oriented man and animal consciousness would not so willingly let go. The cell is individual and struggles for rightful survival, yet its time is limited and the body's survival is dependent upon the cell's innate wisdom. The cell must die finally for the body to survive, and only by dying can the cell further its own development and therefore ensure its own greater survival. So the cell knows that to die is to live. Man's consciousness, and to some extent that of the animals, is more specifically identified with form, however. In order to develop his own kind of individualized awareness, man had to consciously ignore for a while his own place within the structure of the earth. His experience of time would seem to be the experience of his identity. His consciousness would not seem to flow into his body before birth and out of it after death. He would forget that there was time to die, a time to die. He would forget that death meant new life. A natural message had to replace the old knowledge. In the body, certain cells kill others, and in so doing, the body's living integrity is maintained. The cells do each other that service. In the exterior world, certain animals kill others. You had for centuries then, speaking in your limited terms, a situation in which men and animals were both hunters and prey. In those misty eras, from your standpoint, these activities were carried on with the deepest, most sacred comprehension. Again, the slain animal knew that it would later look out through its slayer's eyes, attaining a newer, different kind of consciousness. The man the slayer, understood the great sense of harmony that existed even in the slaying, and knew that in turn the physical material of his body would be used by the earth to replenish the vegetable and animal kingdoms. Even when you lose sight, as you knew you would, of those deep connections, they would continue to operate until, in its own way, Man's consciousness could rediscover the knowledge and put it to use, deliberately and willfully, thereby bringing that consciousness to flower. In your terms, this would represent a great leap, for the egotistically aware individual would fully comprehend unconscious knowledge and act on his own, out of choice. He would become a conscious co-creator. Obviously, this has not as yet occurred. I told, you in, I told you that you presently perceive only the surface of the moment, so you also perceive but one line of the species' development. Yet even within your system, there are hints of the other probable realities that also coexist. The dolphins are a case in point. 
your line of probability. In your line of probability, they are oddities. Yet even now you recognize their great brain capacity and to some dim extent glimpse the range of their own communication. At one time on your earth, in the way you look at time, there were many such species, water dwellers with brain capacities as good and better than your own. Your legends of mermaids, for example, though highly romanticized, do indeed hint of one such species' development. There were several species smaller than dolphins, but generally the same structurally. Their intelligence was indisputable, and old myths of sea gods arose from such species. There is even now an extremely rich emotional life on the part of dolphins, to which you are relatively blind, and more than this, on their on their part a greater recognition of other species than you yourselves have. The dolphins possess a strong sense of personal loyalty and an intimate family pattern, along with a highly developed individual and group recognition and behavior. They cooperate with each other, in other words. They go out of their way to help other species, and yet... They do not take pets. They were also, there were also, however, many varieties of water-dwelling mammals, some combining the human with the fish, though roughly along the lines of a combination chimpanzee-fish type. These were small creatures who moved with amazing rapidity and could emerge onto the land for days at a time. In other probabilities, Water-dwelling mammals predominate. They farm the land as you farm the water, and are only now learning how to operate upon the land for any amount of time, as you are only now learning how to manipulate below the water. The physical universe serves then as a threshold for probabilities, and all possible species find their greatest fulfillment within that system each of them neurologically tuned into their own reality and their own time. So the body itself, as it presently exists, is innately equipped with other neurological responses that to you would seem to be biologically invisible. Nevertheless, your consciousness and your beliefs are what direct this neurological recognition. At birth and before structured learning processes begin, you are far freer in that regard. You could, could walk into yesterday as well as tomorrow at that point of your birth, if you could walk, and indeed your perception brings you events both in and out of time sequence. Responses to out of time events do not bring the infant recognition, approval, or action, however. It immediately begins to learn to accept certain neurological pulses which bring results, and not others, and so neurological patterns are early learned. This can be a frightening process, though it is accompanied by reassurances. The infant sees, out of context, both present and future without discrimination, and I am speaking of images physically perceived. Nightmares on the part of children often operate as biological and psychic releases, during which buried out-of-time perceptions emerge explosively, events perceived that cannot be re reacted to effectively in the face of parental conditioning. The body, then, is indeed a far more wondrous living mechanism than you realize. It is the body's own precognitions that allow the child to develop, to speak and walk and grow. In the same manner, the species, as you think of it, is, at one level, aware of its own probabilities and future lines of development. The child, learning to walk, may fall and hurt itself, yet it does learn. In the same way, the race makes errors, yet in the response to its own greater knowledge, 
it continues to seek out those areas of its own probable fulfillment. Okay, this is where it ends. I'm just going to go through here if you want to read the notes. And then session notes. Just pause. Anyways, um, I wanted to say that this is just a little piece of um, this book, uh, Unknown Reality, The Unknown Reality. Um, I hope that by reading this to you, um, maybe you'll go out and buy the book because this is only just a small, small session. There's so much information in here and uh, obviously all the Seth books so, thanks for watching.